this morning on the 20th uh, Sunday after Pentecost. Special welcome to our guests and visitors this morning. We're glad that you're with us. Today, uh, our theme is joyful and generous. And maybe you've heard the story about the eggs and the ham, or uh, eggs and the bacon breakfast. Uh, in that story, what's the difference between the chicken and the pig? The chicken is involved, but the pig is committed, right? That's true when it comes to our Christian giving as well. It's easy to be joyfully generous when it really doesn't cost us anything. But this Lord's Day, we're reminded from God's Word that joyful generosity really doesn't begin with us. It begins with God. Our joyful generosity flows from a heart that responds, first of all, to the generosity of God and then takes on the priority of God, His kingdom. We'll begin with our opening hymn. It's not in your hymn notes from the, the red hymn note from 93, so I'll direct you to the screen. Uh, now let all love. <laughs>
the order of setting one, page 154 in your hymnal or as on the screen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Christian Father in Heaven has been merciful to us. He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave His life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We speak responsibly the words of the Kyrie, or Lord have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
speak this prayer uh, in the middle of the assembly. David blessed the Lord in the presence of the entire assembly. He said, Blessed are you, Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, from eternity to eternity. To you, Lord, belong greatness, power, glory, victory, and majesty, because everything in the heavens and the earth belongs to you. You, Lord, are exalted as head above everything. The kingdom belongs to you. Riches and honor come from you. You are ruling over everything. In your hand are power and strength. It is in your power to make anyone great and strong. Now, our God, we are thanking you and praising your glorious name. Who am I? Who are my people that we are able to offer willingly like this? For everything comes from you. What have we given to you? What, what we have given to you came from your hand. We are aliens and temporary residents before you, as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no hope of staying. <coughs> Lord our God, all this abundance which we have provided for building a house for you, for your holy name is from your hand. This abundance belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart, and that you take pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. Now with joy I see your people who are present here to bring the offering freely to you. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, preserve forever this purpose and way of thinking in the heart of your people. Direct their heart to you. To my son Solomon, give an undivided heart to keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, to do everything needed to build the citadel for which I have made preparations. David said to the whole assembly, Now bless the Lord your God. So all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed and stretched out flat on the ground before the Lord and the King. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 100b. It's uh, in your worship folder or on the screen. Uh, it's actually a hymn, all people that on earth do well.
verse 38. To understand this, we have to understand a little bit of the commercial world in Jesus' day. A merchant would pour grain into a measuring jar, press it down, shake it together, and let it overflow. And then he empties the jar into the customer's lap, into that loose-fitting garment that would serve as the sack to carry that grain home. Jesus uses that to describe the, generous, uh, the, the generosity enjoyed by the disciple who is generous. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. In fact, the measure with which you measure will be measured back to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Our hymn of the day, 673, O Lord, we praise you. If I ever win the lottery, 
or if I ever get that big inheritance from some long lost relative, I'm going to give a really generous portion to the Lord for his work through his church. Isn't that generous of me? I'm pretty good, right? Wrong. That's not being generous at all, is it? Because they don't have that to be generous with. It, it's not really, it, it's easy to be generous when it costs me nothing. It's easy to be generous with some hypothetical wealth. Wealth I don't have. But what about being generous with whatever wealth we do have? Is it really joyful generosity if it isn't real? Or if it costs us nothing? When King David and his people had the opportunity to raise the money for building the temple for the Lord, they didn't run away from that opportunity. They welcomed that opportunity when David made his gift for the building of the Lord's temple, a temple he would never personally get to see himself. <clears throat> his son Solomon would build. David gave 3,000 talents of gold and 10,000 talents of silver. That's 110 tons of gold, 260 tons of silver. In today's money, that's, that's over uh, $5 uh, billion. And some Bible scholars say the Hebrew wording suggests David gave his entire personal treasure for the building of the temple. And the people followed the example of their king in giving. 190 tons of gold, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, uh, 3,750 tons of iron, plus precious gemstones. Any way you calculate it, those, those amounts are amazing, aren't they? So large that only God could have brought this about. And most of all, like David, they gave willingly and joyfully. They had fun doing it. So what motivated David and the people to be so generous? Our text in our first lesson records David's prayer that accompanied his gift. It shows us what motivated them. It shows that the joyful generosity is always driven by the gospel. David offers a magnificent prayer of praise and thanksgiving. And in that prayer, he puts his offering to the Lord in proper perspective. Because if, if you notice, David acknowledged that he isn't really giving something to the Lord. He's only giving something back. David understood that everything that he had belonged to the Lord. It, it was God who made him king. It was God who made him wealthy. It was God who gave him that 110 tons of gold and 260 tons of silver. And David puts the giving a gift to the Lord in the proper perspective. You see, giving is worship. And worship is giving. And the center of the giving, the source of the giving, is always God, not us. David and the people could only worship and give to the Lord because they had first received from the Lord. For them, the words of our offering him that will sing, we give thee but thine own, were more than words, they were a way of life. God called the universe and everything in it into being. It all belongs to him. But more than simply being the creator of all things, God is also at work in all things for his saving, redemptive purposes. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, David says. David knew that all that he had been able to accomplish, he had been able to accomplish by the Savior God who rules in the hearts of his people by his grace. King David cast his crown before the Lord and said, It's not my kingdom, my throne, my glory, my people, my gold, my plan. Yours is the kingdom, Lord, yours alone. God gave David everything he had and said to David, here, go out and have some fun. Well, that's what David did. Giving all the gold and silver to build God's house was more fun for David than building another palace for himself, building a seaside or mountaintop resort, taking a royal vacation. And why was giving all this to build God's house so much fun for David? Because David's heart 
was responding to God's grace in his life. Who am I? He says. Who are my people that we're able to offer willingly like this? For everything comes from you. What we have given to you came from your hand. We are aliens, temporary residents before you as we're all in fathers. Our days on earth are like a shadow and there's no hope of staying. Lord our God, all this abundance which we have provided for building a house for you, for your holy name is from your hand. This abundance belongs to you. Who am I? David asked. Where would David be without the grace of God? Well, he would still be a shepherd tending the flocks. To the youngest son in the family, never really got to be his own boss, but just stayed home and tended the sheep. Where would David be without the grace of God? He would still be the adulterer who stole Bathsheba from her husband. He would still be the murderer who put her husband and his faithful soldier Uriah on the front line and killed him as a cover. Where would David be without the grace of God? Where would David be if God had not sent the prophet Nathan to call him to repentance? Well, let David tell you in his own words, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away as I groaned all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture was dried up by the droughts of summer. David would have lived his life in dark despair with no hope of heaven. He would have nothing, and he would have nothing, would have been nothing, but for the grace of God in his life. He would have come to the end of his life and had no future to face except hell. Grace. God's undeserved love for undeserving sinners is what enabled David to become great and do great things. And we see how God's grace also overflowed to David's people. Grace enabled David's people to follow their anointed king. It's God's grace that made them great in God's eyes and enabled them to do great things too. Now, ask yourself the question, where would you be without the grace of God in your life? The answer is that we would all be in the same place that millions of people around us are in right now. You would be living your life without any real purpose in life at all. Your purpose would be simply to survive. You would be trying to be somebody by making a name for yourself. You would be checking your Facebook page every 10 minutes to see if someone liked you. You'd be looking back at all the mistakes in your life, all the sins you committed, and have no relief for your guilty conscience. You'd reach the end of the life terrified in your soul because you wouldn't know what was coming next. And if you did know, you'd be even more terrified. Where would you be without God's grace in your life? You see, when beggars like you and I get a glimpse of the depth of God's love for us, we can only say amazing. Who am I? What have I ever done to be worthy of such a wealth of love? Thank God that you and I aren't without God's grace in our life. Instead, God in His grace has called you and I to faith in Jesus and has given us a kingdom, His kingdom, a treasure, a hope that we never deserve. And God in His grace continues to pour out that grace into our hearts and lives through his word and his sacraments. David had it all, didn't he? You have it all as well, don't you? Last Lord's Day we heard our Savior say to his disciples, don't be afraid, little flock, because your Father is pleased to give you a kingdom. God has made you and I to be kings and priests in his kingdom. He has taken away our guilt and our despair. He's redeemed us and made us his very own. He's given us the joy of being part of his forever family. He's given us an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for us. And then he gives us earthly wealth on top of that and says, here, go and have some fun. You recall what Jesus says right after? He tells you not to be afraid because the Father has given you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. In other words, don't be afraid to be generous. 
Your heavenly Father has already given you the kingdom. Your, your treasure is already in heaven. And whatever else it is that you need on earth, your Father knows. He's able to make all grace overflow to you so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will overflow in every good work. For people like David and people like us, giving to help others is more fun than spending money on ourselves. It's more fun to donate to the food pantry than buy a new dress. It's more fun to provide a scholarship to a student preparing for the ministry than to have to have that brand new car. It's more fun to make sure that missionaries get to go out and spread a gospel than to take a cruise to the Caribbean. Why? Be because the generosity of God's grace opens a well of gen joyful generosity in our heart that will never run dry. Our joyful generosity flows from God's joyful generosity to us. Who am I? Who are my people that we are able to offer willingly like this? For everything comes from you. What have we given to you? What we have given to you came from your hand. Not only does the wealth come from God, but also the eager hearts that want to give. Not only the means, the motive. It's all God's gift to us. When you and I understand that, then you and I realize that we never really truly give to God, do we? We only receive. For even when we offer our time. Our service, our abilities, our money, our worship to God. We're only returning to Him what He has first given to us. So we worship God as God. As the giver of every good and perfect gift. And we confess that we're beggars who depend on God's grace and mercy for everything. Joyful generosity. It's all a response to God's generosity. And it's a response that prioritizes his kingdom. When it comes to Christian giving, what's most important is the motivation. Motivation is even more important than the amount that you give. There are many improper motives for giving. Some people give to give some, get something in return. They have a user fee mentality. You know, they might support the church's school or the church's Sunday school or youth activity, but only as long as their kids are involved. Or they might support programs and activities of the church only as long as they agree with them and feel ownership and participate. Another improper motive is giving out of guilt or compulsion. You know, giving because you feel it's your obligation and because someone, whether it be God, the pastor, the church leaders, whoever, might think less of you if you don't deliver on your obligation. Still, other people give simply so other people can see what they give. They make a, a sizable contribution so that at the end of the year, the financial secretary notices how much they've given. Still, others might give out a habit. Now, this one's a little tricky. On one hand, giving to the Lord regularly is a good habit to develop. On the other hand, it's not good to simply give out a habit. Like when someone gives little or no thought, no thought to what they give or why they give. They, they mechanically maybe give the same $20 a week that they've given for the past 20 years without even thinking about it. Now, practically, $20 20 years ago went a lot farther than it does today. But the point is, we need to think about what we're giving. Someone might even give to feel good. And that's related to that guilt motivation. Only here the motive is to make themselves feel good by proving themselves, especially in comparison to others. But again, notice how selfish that is. I want to feel, we should feel good about giving. We should have joyful generosity. But if that's the only reason I give, then it's a really selfish reason, isn't it? There, there are so many improper motives for giving to the Lord and to others, but there's only one proper motivation, one proper motivation, and that is love for the Lord and His kingdom. And you know we love because He first loved us, right? True Christian giving doesn't begin with me, it begins with God. As David said in his prayer, I know, my God, that you test the heart, and you take pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. Now, with joy, I see your people who are present here to bring the offering freely to you. 
Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, preserve forever this purpose and this way of thinking in the heart of your people. Direct their heart to you. Notice David isn't talking so much about what the people gave, but why they gave. They gave with integrity, with a single-minded devotion, mindset for the gospel. And David thanks God for that and prays that that would always be in their heart. Many years later, you know David's descendant and David's Lord actually worshipped in the temple, right? The temple of Jesus day built by King Herod. Remember the temple David Solomon, son Solomon built, was destroyed when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem. And when the Jewish exile returned home after 70 years of captivity, they rebuilt the temple, but it was a far cry from the temple Solomon built. So years later, King Herod was determined to remodel it, which really amounted to remaking it. Now, this was the same Herod who killed all the infants under two in Bethlehem to try to kill Jesus. This Herod remodeled, basically remade a magnificent temple for the Lord that was one of the wonders of the world at the time. But why did he do it? Did Herod have a proper motive for doing so? No. He didn't do it for love of the Lord and his kingdom. Herod did it for himself. King Herod was a selfish man who only thought about himself and his kingdom, not about God and his kingdom. So why would Herod build a temple to the Lord? Because he was an Edomite, a distant cousin of the Jews, and he wanted to gain the favor of the Jewish people. He did what he did to get something in return. He did what he did for his own personal gain. There wasn't an ounce of integrity in Herod's heart and his generosity. By contrast, the gifts of King David and the gifts of the people of his time for the building of the temple were given willingly and with honest intent. They were given with joy and not for personal gain. They were given not to get something in return. In fact, David would never reap the benefits of his generosity in his lifetime. He would never get to walk into that wonderful new temple, the house of God, and gaze on its beauty. And yet, he wrote a song in advance for the dedication of the temple. He, he seems to be imagining what it would be like to walk into that temple when he writes, One thing I ask from the Lord, this is what I seek that I live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Think about it. If David wasn't going to get anything personally out of the gift that he gave to the Lord, then why did he give it? Out of love for the Lord and his kingdom. His church. David gave with single-minded devotion for the gospel. David was providing for the future of God's church. David knew that that temple was going to be a place where the truth of the gospel would be shared, the truth of the Savior who would come from David's own line. That's, the temple would be where that gospel would be proclaimed to future generations. David wanted that for his son Solomon and prayed that God would keep Solomon fully devoted in his heart to God and his purposes. David wanted a place where people from distant lands could come to hear of the one and only true and saving God. David wanted future generations to come to this temple and gaze on the beauty of the Lord and find comfort in the promise of the Savior. And isn't that exactly why you and I also generously give to the Lord and His work of life? You see a purpose for your life and for the earthly blessings that God has given you. A purpose far greater than self-gratification. Your offerings have a kingdom focus. Your gift supports your called workers who preach and teach God's word among you. Your gifts support our Sunday school and our Wednesday school where our children and youth learn more about Jesus and his word and grow in their knowledge and faith. Your gifts support our gospel outreach to our community. Your gifts support the mission efforts of our synod throughout our nation and our world. Your gifts support our synodical ministerial education schools 
so that future generations will have what we have, be able to hear the gospel in its truth and purity. You give your gifts so the people of this generation and future generations can gaze on the beauty of the Lord and find comfort in the promise of the Savior. What could we accomplish, brothers and sisters, together for God's kingdom if gospel-driven, joyful generosity saturated each and every one of our hearts the way it did for King David and his people? Joyful generosity, gospel-driven. It responds to the generosity of God's grace. It prioritizes God's kingdom. Brothers and sisters, pray that God would give you and I just such a heart. Amen. Please stand. Having heard the word of God, we confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not me, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose and again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the prayer of the church, which is printed either on the screen or in your service folder. <clears throat> oh God, our kind and generous Father, we thank and pray you for the many under their blessings you continually shower upon us. It is only by your grace that we are in the age of sinful. Yes, we are in the can stand fully acceptable in your sight. It pleased you to seek out us lost sinners when we sought you not and to send your Son to be our Savior. It pleased you to send the Holy Spirit into our hearts with the gospel message and caused us to believe in you. In your great love for us, you are truly gracious and generous. Help us to acknowledge and appreciate this. Fill our hearts with a living faith that cannot be shaken, and with a pure love for you that remains untainted by the allurements of this present evil world. Give us to do with energetic zeal those things which your true children by faith ought to do. Give us a deep sense of urgency, and give us courage, so that when we are faced with opportunity to witness to your saving grace to others, we will not remain silent. Open our hearts and give generously to your mission carried on by your church, that the gospel of grace may be proclaimed near and far. We bring our offerings of thanks and praise to you, O Father. May they be acceptable in, their, in your sight. We also bring our prayers to you and ask you to hear and answer them. We also bring our sins to you. Forgive them for Jesus' sake. We bring ourselves with all that we are in <laughs> Use us for your own holy purposes. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And now as the gospel-driven gifts of God's people are brought to God's altar, we sing, we give thee for thine name.
along in the hymnal. We're on page 165. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Please remain standing as we sing him 716. Have a good day. 